All right, we're good to start? Okay, right. So, welcome everyone to the, to the panel on space cooperation. Um, we're focusing here on how established space powers can strengthen emerging actors um, in their space goals. Um, a quick introduction about myself. Um, as Raji mentioned, I am sales manager at Space Watch Global. It's an independent magazine uh, which looks at um, space activities and their geopolitical impacts. Um, and switching hats in a more interesting way, I'm also sales and business development manager at PT Scientist, uh, which is a lunar mission flying to the moon uh, in 21, 22, um, in a few years, uh, with our partners like Audi and Vodafone. Right, enough about me. So, first of all, a quick format to, this, um, to the panel. Uh, we're going to have opening statements from all our distinguished panelists here, uh, about 10, 10, 11 minutes uh, each. Um, then I'm going to kick it off with one question that I'm going to address to all the panelists. And from that point onward, uh, we request a lot of uh, interactive sessions. I mean, I'm hoping there's a lot of dialogue that comes out of it uh, at the end of it. Um, all right, uh, just to introduce the panel first, uh, we have Ms. Nevi van Lanningam um, from the State Department, Washington, D.C. Uh, we have Dr. Truong uh, from the Vietnam, he's an associate professor at the Vietnam National University. Um, um, we have Commodore uh, Nishant Kumar, Director at uh, Disarmament and International Security Affairs at the Ministry of External Affairs, India. Um, we have Dr. Rogel, uh, Program Leader at the National Space Development Program uh, in the Philippines. And we have Mr. Pedro Ivo Ferraz da Silva, who is a part of the diplomatic mission of Brazil to India. Right, uh, let's kick it off with uh, Nevi. Would you like to start? Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for um, the honor to, to be here. This is my first time joining the, um, the, the uh, forum, um, and I'm happy to be here. So I first start, um, the question was how major a spacefaring nation can strengthen space emerging uh, country? So as you know, United States has been um, very active in engaging and leading in strengthening the emerging space nation in capacity building since uh, the early 70s. And um, what I'm going to try to do is first just kind of um, go over a little bit of um, briefly um, the most recent policy decision making from the current administration um, to capacity building that the United States has been paving the way for emerging uh, space nation. Let me start. Okay. Um, for us, uh, a space uh, activity in the United States is based on two um, documents, and one of them is the U.S. National Space Policy, which was rolled in in 2010 during the Obama administration. And the, uh, when the uh, Trump administration came into the, um, the White House, um, he changed very little on the, from the U.S. Uh, national space policy on the 2010. And I will mention a little bit what some of the tweaks that he has uh, changed. The other document that we base on in um, space uh, activity is our national uh, security strategy. So those two documents basically is like the Bible of U.S. space uh, activities and policies. Um, this is um, the, um, what I mentioned in terms of the administrations, uh, the Trump administration have changed uh, for the uh, from the 2010 uh, National Space Policy, and it's highlighted, as you see. It's just a little um, sentence that um, changed from the, the old National Space Policy. And one of them, as we underline, is the exploration with commercial and international partners that he emphasized. And um, another thing that uh, the current administration did was the re-establishment of the National Space Council. And to us, that is a very big um, 
big uh, establishment because you put all the space activity, whether it's commercial, civil, and security, under one roof. And that is very, um, very good for, for the uh, space community in the United States. And it's a welcome uh, policy. I'm going to talk a little bit about the SPD-1, which everybody, uh, a little bit, um, my colleagues from yesterday and today mentioned and touched base on some of the uh, words in SPDs 1, 2, 3, and 4, and I just wanted to go over with you and emphasize what it means. So basically for SPD-1, for us, it's basically um, directing the NASA to go back to the moon. And that's basically um, what it's all about. And, and what I would like to mention for the SPD-1, um, the reason um, this itself has opened up a tremendous opportunity for NASA to cooperate with the international space community. And it's part of the uh, Trump administration um, involving international community including the emerging uh, nation to come in and do um, cooperation on technical experts with NASA as we take ourselves to the moon and beyond. SPD-2, um, this is basically, um, for us, is a one-shop stop, um, meaning that within the Department of Commerce for administering and regulating commercial space flight, in, in the formal year during the uh, Obama administration, uh, part of the regulation and export uh, uh, issue and ITAR was based in the State Department. And most of that now has been moved to the commercial uh, side and, it, and it's been uh, regulated and controlled by the Department of Commerce. So for those of you who work in um, purchasing um, satellite parts from the U.S., this has been a welcome uh, entity uh, uh, to, do, to do a one-stop shop and no longer had to deal with the State Department and our, rec and our ITAR regulations. So, um, and that is a welcome um, a policy among the international community, among our allies and our strategic partners. SPD-3, which everybody talked about um, all day today and also yesterday a little bit, um, is the um, space traffic management and the SSA um, issue. Um, for us, United States recognized that space flight safety is a global challenge and will continue to encourage safe and responsible behavior in space while emphasizing the need for international sp transparency and uh, STM, uh, space traffic management data sharing. Um, and, and how is this related to the emerging country? We feel that we um, work to, uh, to basically pave the way um, with some of the um, rules and regulation and rules of the road um, for the newcomers that are coming in so that we'll have a set of um, uh, safety standards and pract best practices for everybody to follow. So this is a, a um, advantage for the, the emerging country to come in as they concentrate more on their space policy, on their national activity, we, United States, and uh, other partners have worked to make sure that um, we have rules of the road for everybody um, for safe practice. I'm going to touch a little bit only on Space Force because this is a domestic uh, agenda and it's not for international discussion. Um, we, the reason we created Space Force, um, we Americans recognize that space is integral part of our way of life and to our national security. It is imperative that the U.S. ensure and fetter access to and freedom to operate in space. 
and that's part of the reason why we created Space Force. Space Force is not a new idea to the United States. We've been talking about it for 20 years. It's just now during this administration, we finally put it into a formal, and it will be the sixth uh, type of uh, force uh, within the United States Armed Force. Okay. Um, and that is the new um, policy that paved the way and helped also um, for the emerging nation to come in and join in the space community. Um, and next, I'm going to talk just briefly about the capacity building that the United States have been offering and available since the 70s for the emerging country and others. I'll start off with NASA. Uh, one example of NASA is the Severe Global. I don't know if you're familiar with that. And that is a, um, basically a, five, um, a joint development initiative by NASA and USAID, uh, work in partnership with a leading regional organization worldwide to help developing countries use information provided by Earth's ob observing satellites and geospatial technology for managing climate risk and land use. So um, I'm not going to go into uh, detail. Or you're welcome to Google it. And it has a five, as you can see, the satellite uh, that operating under the severe system. We have one in West Africa, one in Eastern and Southern Africa. We have one in the Hindu Kush Himalaya and the Lower Mekong, and in South America, and the Mesoamerica um, that manages the challenges in the area of food security, uh, water resources, um, land use change, and natural disaster. So that's one example of what uh, NASA is doing, among other things, um, uh, to, uh, as a providing uh, a capacity building um, worldwide, in, and especially for the emerging country. Another example um, you're familiar with is NOAA. And uh, as mentioned last night, NOAA also provides weather forecasting around the world for free. These are just some of the satellites that NOAA is um, operating around the globe, uh, providing uh, free data uh, to the whole world um, for use and download. Um, and you can find that on the website. Unfortunately, I had an image of the whole uh, satellite, but we, it was too uh, much of a document, so we couldn't load it up. So maybe I'll give it to um, Raji later on, and, and, and you're, you're um, welcome to have it. And this is just some more of the NOAA satellite that been launched um, since the 1972 and future. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit. Everybody's uh, familiar with USGS Landsat. Um, and that is also a, a capacity building for the rest of the world. Uh, we provide uh, free data of Landsat. Um, the, the latest Landsat 9 will be scheduled to launch in 2020. Um, and I don't know if ISRO is a member of the Landsat International Cooperation. Um, so someone can uh, tell me. Um, so it's, it's a cooperation around the world, and, and we work with every country um, develop or developing or underdevelop. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, Landsat is a, a very useful um, in, uh, data uh, information on, on the, um, to, to track land use and document uh, land change due to climate change, urbanization, drought, wildfire, and, and et others, et cetera. Um, and for the next one, I just, um, let's see, give an example a little bit what the US space agreement we have. Just for an example, for NASA, you can see there uh, around the globe, we have about 689 active agreement with 67 country. Uh, NOAA has seven active agreement with more than 10 country, and USGS have an agreement with 20 Landsat's agreement around the world. This is another example that are uh, going um, to the moon and beyond an international cooperation um, based on the SPD-1, 
um, directive and just give you an example of all the uh, international cooperation that um, we are currently working with. Another example of uh, capacity building in for emerging country, um, this was a uh, NASA telescope was uh, flew in into in the middle of the Sahara in, in Senegal and um, Charlie Bolden, the former administrator, were able to be there and um, basically a, a, a goodwill demonstration um, on the looking at the sky um, in the middle of Senegal. And this happened last year. All right, um, the only things that um, I needed to touch base on for now, it's um, United States Space Bilateral uh, with Emerging Country. I cover Asia Pacific uh, with the exception of India and China. Um, China take a whole new person to just cover China, so I don't have time for that. <laughs> so for the Asia Pacific anyway, uh, so we have cooperation with Vietnam, uh, bilateral with Vietnam um, since 2013. We have one with Korea in 2014, um, with Thailand in 2017, and we just finished with Indonesia last month in 2019. So these are some of the um, countries that we work with. Um, also for capacity building, we work very closely with JAXA, uh, cooperation to do the research on ISS um, among the Asia Pacific nation. Um, also want to touch base again, uh, mentioned last night about JSPOC, the Joint Space uh, Operations Center, which uh, operated by our uh, Air Force and it provides collision warning from other satellite and orbital debris and these are also free service from the U.S. to the rest of the world. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Thanks, Nevi. Thank you for giving us a brief overview of the United States space policy. Um, let's move it along with uh, Dr. Truong. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Trung Linh Thuan from uh, Vietnam National University, uh, Vietnam. And uh, firstly, I would like uh, to thank the local organization to invite me as a uh, speaker uh, of this panel, and I have a chance to express uh, our desire to develop space technology in my university as well as in uh, Vietnam. Uh, it is to be said that the question raised in this panel is interesting because developing country much stronger uh, themselves their problem particularly uh, in climate change, disaster management, uh, telecommunication, and other uh, developmental goals using the growth of uh, space uh, science. Uh, and uh, I come from a, a university, so I would like to talk about the uh, science and education cooperation. And uh, with science and education, I think that uh, technology transfer and training experts are a good way to the uh, space cooperation. So, uh, what can we do with the technology transfer in uh, space uh, cooperation? Uh, technology transfer uh, is uh, maybe forbidden in uh, some organization, uh, but I think that with our update technology, and it does not affect the security and economy of the organization. I think it is necessary to the emerging actor. And uh, technology transfer, I as refer here, it may be uh, related to the process development or production on uh, space uh, science. For example, and, and now the, uh, the world technology is uh, interesting, in, interested in uh, uh, build satellite more than uh, 50 kilograms. And uh, so the small satellite, uh, satellite technology may be transferred to the imaging actor uh, space. And uh, the, 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 for the uh, 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 product sharing example, for the joint exploitation result received from uh, satellite such as uh, GIS, that the uh, developing country can determine the, the, uh, their problem, such as the uh, climate change, the flood, the storm, and the forest fires in uh, the, the country, and the computer scientists can, uh, can solve the problem. So uh, what can we do with uh, the training uh, experts? 
um, I think the emerging uh, country of the space can train the export uh, to the established space power, for example, in the US, the France, or India uh, to do the, the internship. And uh, so, and we think that uh, uh, the country may have a cooperation in uh, training PhD students and uh, researchers. And also the um, uh, the two sides, the emerging and the uh, the um, the power country may carry out uh, joint research projects based on the requirement of both sides, for example, bilateral uh, projects. And uh, in conclusion, uh, technology uh, transfer and uh, expert training are two of uh, many ways to strengthen emerging actor space growth. And at a, a new school of aerospace uh, engineering, uh, we do training students and uh, do research on aerospace with the ambition on develop space uh, technology. So that I think the uh, approach is cut in this panel may be applied in uh, our organization. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chuang. Um, Commodore Nishant Kumar. With your permission, can I use it? Definitely, by all means. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a matter of immense privilege for me to participate in the fifth Kalpana Chawla Annual Policy Dialogue. I thank the ORF for inviting me, this being my third year in a row, and compliment it for organizing a very well-structured dialogue. As space is widely regarded a critical front frontier, this session, dedicated to space cooperation, is of vital relevance to us, and I'll be presenting India's perspective on it. India has always recognized that space has dimension beyond national considerations, which can only be addressed along with international partners. As a major space-faring nation, we have made great strides in developing outer space technologies that benefit fellow developing countries, which includes emerging space actors also. And some of the finest expressions of this paradigm can be seen from the beginnings of the program, such as dedication of Thumba Equatorial Rocket Launching Station to the United Nations, and the assistance to an international community of scientists in the study of upper atmospheric phenomena. As on date, ISRO has launched around 400 satellites, which includes 297 foreign satellites from 33 countries using indigenously developed launch vehicles. International cooperation is hardwired into India's space program, and at present, there are more than 200 international cooperation agreements with 51 countries and five international organizations, which provide effective collaborative mechanisms for sharing our vast experience in peaceful uses of outer space. Transcending ideological barriers, India's cooperation has also flowered into different use, including joint space missions, data sharing, capacity building in space applications, and policy coordination. Of great relevance is how this can be evolved in the future as a vibrant instrument of new advances in space activities, including human space flight, space commerce, actions against climate change, and international peace and security. India has signed a space cooperation agreements or memorandum of understanding with a number of countries around the world and collaborates with the states at different levels, sharing information and technology to help grow together. In the last one year, India has entered into agreements on the peaceful uses of outer space with Algeria, Morocco, Sao Tom and Principe, Brunei, South Africa, Indonesia, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan. These MOUs aim at enabling tangible cooperative mechanism in broadly three areas, space science, technology, and applications. It includes planetary exploration, use of a spacecraft, space systems and ground systems, remote sensing of the Earth, satellite communication, and satellite-based navigation. It will also provide impetus to explore newer research activities and application possibilities in space. 
India also actively participates and contributes in various regional and international space forums, such as Group on Earth Observations, GEO, Committee on Earth Observation System, CEOS, International Space Exploration Forum, ISEF, and Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee, IADC. Space is a critical enabler in disaster management, and India is an active participant in various such forums, including the Sentinel Asia Program of Asia Pacific Regional Space Agency Forum, APRSAF, the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, ESCAP, <laughs> and the UN Platform for Space Bait Information for Disaster Management and Emergency Response, UN SPIDER, among others. As a fitting gesture to the regional cooperation initiatives, India has launched a dedicated satellite, namely Satellite for South Asia, in May 2017 for utilizing its communication services by the South Asian nations. Workshop on South Asia ground segment, application and utilization was organized in New Delhi in December 2018 with participation of technical specialists from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Maldives, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. With the Indian Regional Navigational Satellite System, popularly known as NAVIC, now being deployed with full regional service constellation of seven satellites with a footprint existing about 1,500 square kilometer about India, several services such as terrestrial and marine navigation aids for hikers and travelers and visual and voice navigation for drivers can now be extended to India's immediate neighborhood. India continues to share its facilities and expertise in the application of space science and technology through the United Nations affiliated Center for Space Science and Technology Education in Asia and the Pacific, CSSTAP, at Dehradun. India has also commenced capacity building program on a small satellite realization named UNNATI, which stands for Unispace Nano Satellite Assembly and Training by ISRO, as part of Unispace Plus 50 initiatives. It is, it is aimed to provide opportunities, much needed opportunities, to our fellow developing countries to develop and strengthen their capabilities in assembling, integrating, and testing a small satellite. The program is for a period of three years, benefiting 90 candidates from 45 countries. The first batch of Unnati program with 30 participants from 17 countries was undertaken in January this year. It is evident that space cooperation has occupied vital place in India's policy perspective. Following the principle of we practice what we preach, it is felt that capability enhancement and capability building are two key components which can strengthen emerging actor space growth. By capability enhancement, we mean material assistance in terms of technology, applications, and services. Examples would be South Asia satellite, NAVIC, provisioning launch services, sharing of data, assistance in disaster management with space-based applications, and conduct of workshops and seminars like this. On the other hand, capacity building would translate to developing of requisite skill sets by theoretical or practical means. Example in this case would be the courses undertaken at CSSTAP at Dehradun or pro programs like Unnati. I would like to conclude by saying that a space cooperation has potential to serve as an instrument to bridge earthly crisis for the sake of our planet, and we must continue our efforts in this direction. I look forward to question, questions during question hour session. Thank you. Thank you, Commodore Nishant Kumar. Um, Dr. Rojo, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank ORF for inviting me here. Uh, this is my second time here at the Kalpana Chawla uh, Annual Space Policy Dialogue, and uh, uh, the, th the points that I'm going to raise in this uh, for or in this panel is uh, not necessarily. It's it's more of a personal perspective, which is partially shared by the national uh, perspective of the Philippines. So the benefits provided by space has led to the democratiz democratization with more emerging space nations establishing their own national programs. So for emerging space countries, uh, the launch of a country's first satellite is a source of pride galvanizing the nation together, even for a brief moment. More countries are now realizing that space is already a necessity rather than a luxury, 
and that it is a vital tool to address socioeconomic benefits or socioeconomic issues and an opportunity to establish bilateral and multilateral, multilateral agreements. Space cooperation is therefore necessary, whether in technology development, capacity building, or even just due to economics. Emerging space nations are usually at a disadvantage compared to established ones in terms of access to space and new technologies. Oftentimes, a north-south cooperation involves assistance and technology transfer that between two nations that may lead to an imbalance, usually to the detriment of emerging space nations. Though this is a political reality worldwide, it has made some countries wary of cooperation agreements due to concerns of being economic, economically exploited and politically influenced. This can lead to the discouragement of emerging space nations from participating in such cooperations, possibly resulting in countries conducting its own space activities independently without assistance or wisdom of experience from established space nations. So for the Philippines, we're actually one of the latecomers in terms of the space, uh, space cooperation or space development. Uh, from virtually having nothing in our very minimal activities in 2000, 2013, we have significantly progressed uh, uh, a lot, whether it's in the legal aspect and the technical aspect. I think one of the advantages that the Philippines had was that being a late entrant pro provided us the opportunity to learn from the experience of other space, uh, established space nations as well as other emerging space nations. So in 2014, we established our uh, National Space Development and Utilization Policy, which identified six key development areas. The, the sixth, or one of the six key KDAs is actually international cooperation, and we have agreements right now with, uh, with Japan, which is one of our strongest partners. We have agreements, agreements coming with, uh, upcoming with uh, UK and other countries. And uh, in 2014, we launched our first microsatellite, uh, uh, sorry, in 2016, we launched our first microsatellite with the assistance of Japan, uh, as well as uh, the second and the third one in 2018, just last year. And we've, we have even hosted the Asia Pacific Regional Space Agency Forum. So despite being an emerging space nation and a late entrant, the Philippines has, is showing a lot of, uh, lot of uh, responsibility in becoming, a, in becoming a sp responsible space actor, or showing our commitment to becoming a responsible space actor. However, the, uh, as with most emerging space nations, there are a lot of commonalities. Uh, well, most emerging space nations, uh, the problems usually lack, uh, arise from the lack of resources and technical capabilities, the lack of the space uh, policy and awareness of the need for space security and sustainability, and finally, having, seeing space as a political and uh, diplomatic tool. So therefore, it is, uh, it is therefore important that established and emerging space nations to cooperate in a manner that would be beneficial to both parties and, that, and to the space community. The responsibility of ensuring the sustainability of the space regime is jointly shared between established and emerging space nations. It is vital that both sides are aware of their roles and what they can contribute and gain from each other in the interest of transparency and in order to establish trust and confidence leading to long-term cooper long cooperation. So the next few points is uh, I would like to raise is what are essentially the roles of both established and emerging space nations when it comes to promoting, uh, or co uh, promoting cooperation in the space regime. For emerging space actors, uh, I think one of the most important things is that each, uh, each country or each actor should do an independent assessment on the, uh, on the national needs for space to reduce the incidence of ineffective cooperation, uh, cooperation agreements. So we've seen a lot of these happen in the past, uh, and we want to minimize this as well in the future. However, emerging space actors should also be committed to becoming resp responsible space uh, nations uh, committed to space security and to space, space sustainability, and this can be seen, seen by providing transparency on what their national programs are and adherence to international space treaties like uh, the Outer Space Treaty. At the same time, this, uh, in, upon learning uh, or having, gain, gaining the assistance from uh, established space nations, 
uh, emerging space nations should also be an active contributor to the international space development by doing capacity building and capability development, and it should identify its niche, its niche areas where they can significantly contribute to the international space community. Of course, this entails that cooperation should be uh, with respons other responsible space actors and be cautious of seemingly enticing cooperation efforts. And this is something, this is a problem that we've seen not just in, uh, in the Philippines, but also in the uh, other parts of the Southeast Asian region. And finally, uh, emerging space nations or uh, emerging space actors should be more active and dynamic uh, in discussions in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the international community, for example, in COPUOS, whether this is for legal or for technical aspect, uh, since emerging space nations are more agile and more flexible. So we have more capability to adapt to the changing needs, uh, economic and geopolitical uh, realities. On the other hand, for established space actors, uh, I think the primary uh, role is to set an example as a role or be a role model in promoting responsible space actions and uh, demonstrate the commitment to space security and sustainability that encourages space nation, uh, that emerging space nations can emulate. Of course, this entails also sharing uh, not just the technical best practices, but also the legal best practices and veer away from uh, from agreements that would seem like a sales and marketing agreement. And this is something that even the industry is starting to notice. So uh, cooperation agreements, uh, that uh, so these kinds of uh, cooperation agreements in the past eventually further burdens emerging space nations. Uh, of course, the emerging uh, established space actors would also have, should also have the responsibility to work with uh, key partners and who are fairly responsible and uh, providing transparency. But uh, another point is uh, to encourage the development and innovation through technology transfer, but this should, not also, this should not stifle the growth, hinder the development, and impose restrictions on emerging space nations. So emerging space, space nations should be provided with similar opportunities enjoyed by established space nations in the early years of their development. And finally, I think, uh, and this is something that uh, everyone should, uh, they, uh, should take, I think we should take note, is that we know the imbalance between uh, established space nations and emerging space nations. So at the moment, it's coming to the point that uh, at, at the initial stages, it's a more of like a teacher-student relationship. But over time, as these emerging space nations should progress, it should, be, uh, trend, should transcend or it should be changed into something that uh, seeing emerging space nations, not just a, a former student, but more or less as an equal or as a colleague in the international space community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rojo. Um, Pedro, you have the floor now. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank ORF for the kind invitation, especially to my dear friend, uh, Haji. Um, so if we think about this uh, division between established uh, space power and um, uh, emerging uh, space nations. I would say that uh, Brazil probably stands uh, in between. Uh, so we have a, a space program which is as old as the Indian space program, started in the early 60s. And uh, with some up, ups and downs, we've managed to build up a con comprehensive infrastructure of uh, com comprehensive set of infrastructures and uh, institutions like the National Institute for Space Research, which is responsible for developing um, and also for uh, assembling and operating uh, satellites. We have two launch centers in Brazil, uh, Barreira do Inferno and Alcântara, and uh, also, one institute, uh, the Institute for Aeronautics and Space, responsible for developing uh, sounding rockets, um, uh, micro-satellite uh, launchers, and uh, innovative propulsion, uh, propulsion engines. One of the current projects going on there is uh, using ethanol as a, a, a liquid fuel. So, um, and uh, in, in this... Uh, let's say, during this 60 years of uh, existence of our space program, our um, uh, international cooperation has been really at the heart of, uh, of uh, uh, our initiatives. Uh, cooperation uh, with established uh, 
space powers with uh, countries that are at the similar level as Brazil is, and also with emerging uh, uh, space sectors. So in the case with India, we have an agreement that was, uh, was signed in 2004. As of now, we have, been, uh, we have upgraded some of our ground stations to receive uh, sat uh, images from uh, Resource Sat 1 and 2 from India. And these uh, very, very uh, ground stations are used or support some of the uh, Indian missions like Mangalyan and uh, the soon to come Chandrayaan as well. So uh, we have had this cooperation for 14 years now. And uh, next uh, major milestone in this Indo-Brazilian cooperation will be uh, the launch next year of the first 100% Brazilian satellite called Amazonia 1. It will be launched uh, next year from uh, Indian PSLV. Um, we have not only uh, cooperation with these, uh, let's say, space powers, but also with emerging nations. So, um, we uh, last year we have uh, 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 the Kingdom of Bhutan has approached Brazil to start a cooperation in uh, space, precisely because of our expertise in monitoring dense forested areas. And uh, we, we, let's say, it's uh, is at the heart of the Brazilian space program precisely because of our need to monitor deforestation in the Amazon region and also to control and monitor our borders with uh, Peru, Colombia, Venezuela. So, uh, and also, not only bilaterally, we have been cooperating, also, let's say, multilateral, international, inter-regional fora. Uh, BRICS being one of the examples uh, in which we have been uh, negotiating the, let's say, uh, setting up of a uh, BRICS uh, satellite uh, constellation, uh, constellation of sa satellites. So this is also uh, another avenue of uh, cooperation that uh, our space program is uh, looking for. Um, as uh, it was said here, uh, in the case of India, so international cooperation is uh, hardwired uh, into also Brazilian space uh, uh, program, uh, and also looking into the future. So we, uh, the current priority of the Brazilian space program is uh, to upgrade our uh, space uh, launch center um, in Alcântara to an uh, international uh, space center. Uh, as maybe some of you know, Alcantara is quite optimally uh, located. It's just two, two degrees south of the equator, which is, makes it uh, quite optimal for uh, the launch of uh, uh, for geostationary launches. Uh, so the idea now of the Brazilian government is to open up Alcantara to make it an uh, international uh, space center and rent, uh, I mean, the commercial modalities are still to be agreed, but to rent launch space for other nations or for private uh, actors as well to make use of these, uh, the infrastructure that we'll be building there. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Um, thank you, everyone else, as well, for your initial statements. Now, I'd like to quickly open up the discussion, and you, uh, uh, Dr. Rogel, you did mention it a, a fair bit in your, um, in your statement. What are the major challenges for uh, space cooperation, uh, especially when you consider not just technology transfer or technology sharing, but also geopolitics, because that plays a big part uh, when it comes to um, you know, space cooperation? So if I could get you know, your quick you know, one-liners on this, and then we open it up to the audience. Okay, uh, it's good that you mentioned that the, pro the challenges is not just in the technical aspect, but also in the legal aspect as well. Uh, I think for the technical aspect, it boils down to several things. One is the absorbing capacity of emerging space nations. Uh, the transfer of technology, uh, in some cases, we've seen instances that uh, the, transfer, the technology transfer is not really to the, to the uh, benefit of the emerging space nation, but mainly this is be the burden on this part is more on the emerging space nation because as uh, new entrants in the space sector, countries such as the Philippines should realize or should know what they what they need and what kind of cooperation that they should be looking into, not just uh, 
agreeing with anyone who comes along. And uh, of course, this entails also providing a whole a transparency on what their national space programs are looking towards into. In the geopolitical uh, aspect, uh, well, we, we know that uh, space is now being seen as a diplomatic, as a political, and in some cases even as an economical tool for uh, the various countries. So this is something that uh, has to be, well, we don't know how it should go really, but uh, everyone should be cognizant of this fact. And also, we need to have more voice in the international community, especially for emerging space nations, especially uh, like in crafting new uh, space agreements, because we have to realize that whatever is decided by, uh, let's say, established space nations affects not just them, but also uh, emerging space nations and future countries who would want to venture into space as well. Thank you. Anyone else want to pick up on that point? Since you mentioned about the geopolitics part uh, in the space cooperation, uh, I would like to quote one incident. At a news conference in 1962, John F. Kennedy said, and I quote, we believe that when men reach beyond this planet, they should leave their national differences behind them, unquote. And this, quote, this uh, statement was made uh, at the heights of uh, Cold War. So uh, what I want to say that uh, geopolitics aside, uh, the space cooperation is a must. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you. Right, let's open up to the audience now. Let's go for it. Hello, Daniel, Daniel Porras from Unidir. When we often talk about space security challenges, we refer to the three Cs, congested, contested, and competitive. Congested suggests that there, are incre that there are too many actors and that perhaps we don't want new actors coming into space. So I wonder if that's necessarily the right word, but how would you recommend that we perhaps change uh, or work within a you know, cooperation to try and encourage as many new actors as possible without creating additional problems within outer space? And if you can think of another word other than congested, I would be really grateful. Pedro, you want to take that? Yeah, actually, uh, this question uh, allows me to, to uh, let's say, um, highlight one of the priorities of the, let's say, priority avenues of, uh, uh, let's say, the reasons why Brazil uh, seeks uh, international cooperation in, in space. And it's not only for, let's say, technology transfer, uh, but also for... Uh, let's say, sharing of risks and costs. So if we can have more and more projects in which we are able to share resources, share costs, and then share resources that are used in outer space, I think that's, uh, uh, I think, uh, one way to go. So with uh, China, Brazil has a 20-year-long uh, project called CBERS, uh, called China-Brazil Earth Resource Satellites in which, uh, let's say, 50% of the costs to build the satellite are uh, responsibility of Brazil, 50% are of China, and the operation of the, these uh, very same, the various satellites are also shared. Half of the year it's conducted by Brazil, half of the other year conducted by China. So I think that's just one maybe example where we can share resources among various players and then perhaps avoid this congestion of space. I think um, also sharing, but also um, transparency, um, uh, rules of the road, best practices, some of these things that could avoid being congested and contested, and that's the goal for everybody. Thank you. Uh, anybody more questions? Tom? Uh, Tom, Tom Zegert from Berlin Space Technologies. Um, so we are a German-based company and one of the leaders in uh, basically capacity building. So I think uh, um, my comment on this is uh, especially not only between the country to country, but uh, between the uh, basically where a country represented by, uh, by a company is doing the capacity building. And there, 
through my research, uh, we have established that uh, the biggest uh, elephant in the room, so to say, is that there's obviously a, a conflict of interest, right? Because the the uh, the, the the new space nations uh, want to be independent as fast as possible, and the companies that do the training uh, have a business model only as long as they can train. And if you look in all these uh, past uh, models, you can see that uh, so far there's uh, very little uh, actual success. And um, I think uh, one of the tasks and uh, was one of the responsibilities uh, for us as uh, the ones that are providing this uh, training is to make that uh, better uh, and uh, make it a win-win for, uh, for both entities. And what we have uh, uh, been doing is we have uh, been trying to establish new business models in which, uh, in which this, uh, this can be better co-aligned. And one of the examples that I will present tomorrow is a uh, joint venture together with an Indian company to establish a mass manufacturing factory here in, uh, in India, in particular in Ahmedabad, uh, to manufacture up to 250 microsatellites, so 50 to 150 kilograms every year. Um, so that said, um, what I would be interested in is obviously also in improving uh, the way that, uh, that, that we are b doing business. And since we have uh, 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 representatives of nations that have uh, already been uh, participating in, uh, in, in these programs, I would be interested in to learn uh, if they can share what things went very well and what things they uh, see should be improved, uh, in particular on the on the end of the uh, of the um, of the uh, of the uh, maybe of the company that is doing this type of uh, of training. Okay. okay uh, I I I would like to answer the the question that. Uh, first of all, uh, we uh, that a new school of uh, aerospace engineering, so uh, uh, we should uh, invest, uh, have a, a big investment in uh, material for students, and we buy the for example, the model for the student and for the lecturer to uh, do research in uh, space engineering. I think that if you uh, if you uh, if the, the, the company in uh, in uh, uh, power nation then can um, uh, give a for some of the good model to for the student and for the expert in uh, in emerging country and I think that is very, very good. Okay. Anyone else have learnings in cooperation space? You and I have had a lot of discussion in this <laughs> subject matter in the past. Yeah, I agree that uh, in the past most cooperation agreements are, are more of a one-way thing, but uh, the problem is not just uh, coming from the established space nations, but also from the emerging space nations. They should know on what they want or what they need for their own countries. And then uh, seek out the partnerships that would be mutually beneficial. Of course, there's, there is a business interest, there's an economic or there's a, a, even a political interest in, uh, in coming from established space nations. But I think there could, there's, it's possible that we can find a middle way that is both win-win for emerging and uh, established uh, space nations. Uh, whether that, but that's on more in a, as of now like a case-to-case -case basis, depending on the kind of agreement that uh, you would have. But hopefully in the future, uh, and this is something that even industry is uh, noticing. Uh, it's not just new space companies who are uh, noticing this, but even established uh, companies, uh, the big, big big companies are seeing that it can no longer be just a outright sort of like sales of a satellite system, but there has to be always a component for capacity building and in some instances, a component for in-country manufacturing. Of course, emerging space nations would want to have that, but at the end of the day, you have to look at the economics of whether it would be really feasible for emerging space nations to have in-country capabilities or just uh, have cooperation agreements between uh, established and uh, their established and emerging space nations. Thank you. Uh, respecting the time schedule, uh, let's take one more question. I'll go over this side. Yeah, the lady there. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Aurja from Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, I wanted to ask this question particularly in the morning session, but then the fact that you also talked about the division between emerging space nations and the established space powers. Uh, I wanted to ask, like, the way uh, when India launched its, its ASAT uh, in uh, February, and it was blamed for the space debris created by NASA on Twitter and everywhere, so the fact that Russia, America, even for that matter, China, have created a sufficient amount of space debris. So how are we looking at common but differentiated responsibilities, CBDR, the principle that is applied in um, environment, 
which is a common heritage of mankind. The same way, the space is also the common heritage of mankind. And how do we look at the uh, division between developing countries and developed countries for that matter, how the responsibility sharing would be done. I know for that matter that CBDR is mentioned in Outer Space Treaty, but how much progress has been done on that fact? I would like to know. Thank you. Coming in with the tough questions. Anyone want to pick that up? Can we get a response from India, maybe? <laughs> <Okay>. No problem. Uh, First, I would like to clarify about the space debris issue from the Indian context. Uh, as far as the concerns regarding space debris generated by the test are concerned, uh, it may be noted that India, conscious of such concerns and the dangers posed by space debris, conducted the test in a manner to minimize the incidence and, longevit and the longevity of space debris. After having conducted extensive simulations, the test was intentionally conducted in low Earth orbit at an altitude of 280 kilometers to ensure that there would be minimal space debris and that it would not pose any danger to objects in outer space. As per our simulation studies, whatever debris would have been generated was expected to have decayed and fallen back to Earth within a brief time frame. Uh, further, there has been no, uh, uh, there's no such uh, danger posed uh, by a space debris by us. Then coming to the uh, responsibilities as such, there is an interagency uh, debris coordination committee, and that looks into the space debris issues. We are an active part of, uh, India is an active member of this uh, coordination committee also. And uh, we have taken uh, all measures possible for mitig mitigating any space debris as such. And there are collaborative mechanisms under this uh, coordination committee also, which looks into this space, uh, on this issue. So this issue is very much being dealt by uh, different forums, uh, like uh, IADC I pointed out. Then there in Corpus we are discussing this issue. In UNDC also we are discussing this issue. So uh, there is a fair amount of discussions going on. And uh, there are uh, methods and mechanisms being worked out to mitigate this danger. Thank you. I'm loving this discussion. Let's take another question. I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> right, let's go for it. the final one, I Hi, promise. Uh, so, Snarayan, um, uh, another question to you, Commodore, if I'm getting the rank right, sorry. Uh, um, so, uh, basically, my question is if uh, India will be interested in um, joining the international efforts in space situational awareness by adding sensors which are India-based, for example, possibly adding the MOTR radar uh, or the upcoming new phased array radars, uh, for space situational awareness into the global domain. Uh, because essentially, right now, the world relies mostly on NORAD uh, and US capabilities. And there's not enough, I, in my uh, assessment, not enough international partners to add more sensors across the world. Uh, so I wanted to know, uh, one, that. And the second is, if India will also come up with a space doctrine As far as the uh, first question is the space situational awareness. Uh, we have realized that the space situational awareness is very important. And until you know what is happening, you cannot take any measures, be a mitigating measure as such. And uh, we have our uh, SSA, some of the SSA assets, but that might not be enough. No one country can uh, is able to have uh, develop a situational awareness in this space, which will uh, have entire knowledge about domain awareness in space is concerned. So uh, we feel that SSA is a very important component of international cooperation also. And uh, uh, we have our mechanism in terms of assets, in terms of organization. If you look into it, uh, Department of Space has, is getting a new uh, division on space situational awareness. Uh, so we are working there also. And as I mentioned in international cooperation front, we are uh, talking to like-minded countries also about data sharing. Some of the data, as you know, is available in open sources. And that is available to us by uh, which we utilize this data to uh, carry out collision avoidance and those kind of predictive analysis, uh, which is very important from the space situational awareness point of view. But uh, we are looking at the international cooperation angle also. And uh, we will, uh, so that more and more data is there, which can be shared with more countries. And then you have a comprehensive space situational awareness. 
Uh, I can't comment on the space talk. I'm not aware about it. Thank you. And I think with this, we can conclude this panel session. But obviously, this discussion goes uh, further. And don't, I mean, if there's questions you still have, you can always approach the panelists. Uh, but I think uh, for now, we're, we're, we're good with the panel. But thank you so much uh, for joining us in this panel. Thank you.